everyone, I'm Miss Mary Beth. I'm the Youth Services Librarian at Ingalls Memorial Library and Ringe, and I'm here today for Armchair Adventures. And that's our series where every day I read a little bit of a book to you, and eventually we finish a whole book together. And the book we're reading right now is Peter Pan and Wendy by J.M. Barry. And this book was a play that was first written in 1904, and then this book was published in 1911. And what this, do you know the story? Have you seen the movie? Or heard it before? Well, we're, we only just started. So right now, what's happening is we have three siblings, Wendy, John, and Michael Darling. And they have two very nice parents, Mr. and Mrs. Darling. And one night, when Mr. and Mrs. Darling are out at a party, Peter Pan, the boy who never grows up, comes into their bedroom. And he takes them. He takes them with Tinkerbell, his fairy. They learn to fly. And they fly all around the world. And eventually they get to Neverland, right? And that's where we are right now. They're about to end up in Neverland. And I think Peter wants Wendy to be in Neverland because I think he wants her to take care of him and all of his lost boys, all of his friends. But John and Michael are along for the adventure. So let's see what happens. And another thing was as they were getting there, they kind of got a little separated. And Tinkerbell is jealous of Wendy. So she was leading Wendy astray. She was going to harm her, I think. But I don't know. So let's find out together. Chapter 5 is called The Island Come True. Feeling that Peter was on his way back, the Neverland had again woken to life. We ought to use the plooper effect and say wakened, but woke is better. And it was always used by Peter. In his absence, things are usually quiet on the island. The fairies take an hour longer in the morning. The beasts tend to their young. The Native Americans feed heavily for six days and nights. And when pirates and lost boys meet, they merely bite their thumbs at each other. But with the coming of Peter, who hates lethargy, they are all underway again. If you can put your ear to the ground now, you would hear the whole island seething with life. On this evening, the chief forces of the island were disposed as follows. The lost boys were out looking for Peter. The pirates were out looking for the lost boys. The Native Americans were out looking for the pirates. And the beasts were out looking for the Native Americans. They were all going round and round the island. But they did not meet, because all were going at the same rate. All wanted blood, except the boys, who liked it as a rule, but tonight were out to greet their captain. The boys on the island vary, of course, in numbers, according as they get killed and so on. And when they seem to be growing up, which is against the rules, Peter thins them out. But at this time, there were six of them, counting the twins as two. Let us pretend to lie here among the sugar cane and watch them as they steal by in single file, each with his hand on his dagger. They are forbidden by Peter to look in the least like him, and they wear the skins of bears slain by themselves, in which they are so round and furry that when they fall they roll. The lost boys have therefore become very sure-footed. The first lost boy to pass is Tootles, not the least brave but the most unfortunate of all that gallant band. He had been in fewer adventures than any of them, because the big things constantly happened just when he stepped around the corner. All would be quiet. He would take the first opportunity of going off to gather a few sticks for firewood, and then when he returned, the others would be sweeping up the blood from an adventure. This ill luck had given him a gentle melancholy, but instead of souring his nature, it had sweetened it, so that he was quite the humblest of the boys. Poor kind Tootles, there is danger in the air for you tonight. Take care lest an adventure is now offered you, which, if accepted, will plunge you in the deepest woe. Sounds like our narrator knows what's going on. Hmm. Tootles, the fairy, Tink, who is bent on mischief this night looking for a tool, and she thinks you the most easily tricked of the boys. Beware of Tinkerbell. Would that he could hear us. But we are not really on the island, are we? And Tootles passes by, biting his knuckles. Next comes Nibs, the happy and debonair, followed by Slighty who cuts whistles out of the trees and dances ecstatically to his own tunes. Slightly is the most conceited of the boys. He thinks he remembers the days before he was lost, with their manners and customs, and this has given his nose an offensive tilt. Curly is fourth. He is a pickle. And so often he has had to deliver up his person when Peter said sternly, Stand forth, the one who did this thing! That now, at the command, he stands forth automatically, whether he has done the thing or not. Last come the twins who cannot be described because we should be sure to be describing the wrong one. Peter never quite knew what twins were, 
and his band were not allowed to know anything he did not know. So these two were always vague about themselves, and did their best to give satisfaction by keeping close together in an apologetic sort of way. The boys vanish in the gloom, and, after a pause, but not a long pause, for things go briskly on the island, come the pirates on their track. We hear them before they are seen, and it is always the same dreadful song. Avast, avast, belay, yo-ho, heave-ho, a pirating we go, and if we're parted by a shot, we're sure to meet below. A more villainous-looking lot never hung in a row on execution dock. Here, a little in advance, ever and again with his head to the ground listening, his great arms bare, pieces of eight in his ears as ornaments, is the handsome Italian Kecko, who cut his name in letters on the back of the governor of the prison at Gao. The gigantic man behind him has had many names since he dropped the one which dusky mothers still terrify their children on the banks of the Guadamo. Here is Bill Jukes, every inch of him tattooed. The same Bill Jukes who got six dozen on the walrus from Flint before he could drop the bag of moiders. And Cookson, who is said to be Black Murphy's brother. But this was never proved. And then there's Gentleman Starkey, once an usher in a public school and still dainty in his ways of killing. And then there's Skylights, and the Irish bosun Smee. An oddly genial man who stabbed, so to speak, without offense, and was the only nonconformist in Hook's crew. And then there was Noodler, whose hands were fixed on backwards. And there was Robert Mullins, and Alf Mason, and many another ruffian long, known long and feared on the Spanish main. There are a lot of pirates, huh? In the midst of them, the blackest and largest jewel in that dark setting, reclined James Hook, or, as he wrote himself, Jazz Hook, of whom it is said he was the only man that Sea Cook feared. He lay at his ease in a rough chariot drawn and propelled by his men, and instead of a right hand, he had the iron hook, which ever and anon he encouraged them to increase their pace. As dogs this terrible man treated and addressed them, and as dogs they obeyed him. In person he was cadaverous and black visited and his hair was dressed in long curls, which at little distance, which at a little distance looked like black candles, and gave a singularly threatening expression on his handsome countenance. His eyes were of the blue of the forget-me-not, and of a profound melancholy, save when he was plunging his hook into you, at which time two red spots appeared in them and lit them up horribly. <gasps> in manner, something of the grand seigneur still clung to him, so that he have even ripped you up with an air, and I have been told that he is a raconeur, of repute. He was never more sinister than when he was most polite, which is probably the truest test of breeding, and the elegance of his diction, even when he was swearing, no less than the distinction of his demeanor, showed him one of a different cast from his crew, a man of indomitable courage. It was said of him that the only thing he shied at was the sight of his own blood, which was thick and of an unusual color. In dress, he somewhat aped the entire association with the name of Charles II, having heard it said in some earlier period of his career that he bore a strange resemblance to the ill-fated Stuarts. And in his mouth, he had a holder of his own contrivance, which enabled him to smoke two cigars at once. But, undoubtedly, the grimmest part of him was his iron claw. Let us now kill a pirate to show Hook's method. Skylights will do. As they pass, Skylights lurches clumsily against him, ruffling his lace collar. The hook shoots forth. There's a tearing sound and one screech, and then the body is kicked aside, and the pirates pass on. <gasps> hook has not even taken the cigars from his mouth. Oh my goodness. That's brutal. Such is the terrible man against whom Peter Pan is pitted. Which will win? On the trail of the pirates, stealing noiselessly down the warpath, which is not visible to in inexperienced eyes, come the Native Americans, every one of them with his eyes peeled. They carry tomahawks and knives, and their bodies gleam with paint and oil. Strung around them are scalps of boys as well as pirates, for these are the Piccaninny tribe, and not to be confused with the softer-hearted Delawares or the Hurons. In the van, on all fours, is great little big panther, a brave of so many scalps that in his present position they are somewhat impede his progress. Bringing up the rear, the place of greatest danger, comes Tiger Lily, proudly erect, a princess in her own right. She is the most beautiful of the dusky Dianas, and she is the belle of the Piccaninnies, coquettish, cold, and amorous by turns, and there is not a brave who would not have been the, have the wayward thing to wife, but she staves off the altar with a hatchet.
<laughs> Observe how they pass over fallen twigs without making the slightest noise. The only sound to be heard is their somewhat heavy breathing. The fact that they're all just a little fat after all the eating they did. But in time, they will work this off. For the moment, however, it constitutes their chief danger. The Native Americans disappear as they come like shadows. And soon their place is taken by the beasts, a great and motley procession, lions, tigers, bears, and the innumerable smaller savage things that flee from them. For every kind of beast, and more particularly, all the man-eaters live cheek by jowl on the favorite island. Their tongues are hanging out, and they are hungry tonight. When they have passed comes the last figure of all, a gigantic crocodile. We shall see for whom she is looking presently. The crocodile passes, but soon the boys appear again. For the procession must continue indefinitely until one of the party stops or changes its pace. Then quickly they will be on top of one another. All are keeping a sharp lookout in front, but none suspects that the danger may be creeping up from behind. This shows how real the island was. The first to fall out of the moving circle were the boys. They flung themselves down on the sword close to their underground home. I do wish Peter would come back, every one of them said nervously. Though in height and still more in breadth, they were all larger than their captain. I'm the only one who's not afraid of the pirates, slightly said, in the tone that prevented his being a general favorite. But perhaps some distant sound disturbed him, for he added hastily. But I wish we would, he would come back and tell us whether he had heard anything more about Cinderella. The boys talked of Cinderella, and Toodles was confident that his mother must have been very like her. It was only in Peter's absence that they could speak of mothers, the subject being forbidden by him as silly. All I remember about my mother, Nibs told them, is that she often said to father, Oh, how I wish I had a checkbook of my own. I don't know what a checkbook is, but I should love to give my mother one. While the boys talked, they heard a distant sound. You or I, not being wild things of the woods, would have heard nothing. But the boys heard it, and it was the grim song. Yo ho, yo ho, the pirate life, the flag of skulls and bones, a merry hour, a hemp and rope, and haver Davy Jones. At once, the lost boys. But where are they? They are no longer there. Rabbits could have not could not have disappeared more quickly. I shall tell you where they are. With the exception of Nibs, who has darted away to re reconnoiter, they are already in their home under the ground, a very delightful residence of which we shall see a good deal present presently. But how have the boys reached it? For there is no entrance to be seen, not so much a pile of brushwood, which, if removed, would disclose the mouth of a cave. Look closely, however, and you may note that there are several large trees, each having in its hollow trunk a hole as large as a boy. These are the seven entrances to the home under the ground, for which Hook has been searching in vain these many moons. Will he find it tonight? As the pirates advanced, the quick eye of Starkey sighted Nibs disappearing through the wood, and at once his pistol flashed out, but an iron claw gripped his shoulder. Captain, let go, he cried, writhing. Now, for the first time, we hear the voice of Hook. It was a black voice, a dark voice. Put back that pistol first, it said threateningly. Starkey answered, It was one of the boys you hate. I could have shot him dead. Aye, and the sound would have brought Tiger Lily's Native Americans upon us. Do you want to lose your scalp? Shall I go after him, Captain? asked pathetic Smee, and tickle him with Johnny Corkscrew. Smee had a pleasant name for everything, and his cutlass was Johnny Scork Corkthrew, because he wriggled it in the wound. Oof. One could mention many lovable traits in Smee. Johnny's a silent fellow, he reminded Hook. Not now, Smee, Hook said darkly. He is only one, and I want the mischief of all seven. Scatter and look for them. The pirates disappeared among the trees, and in a moment their captain and Smee were all alone. Hook cried a sigh, a heavy sigh, and I know not why it was. Perhaps it was because of the soft beauty of the evening. But there came over him a desire to confide to his faithful bosom the story of his life. Hook spoke long and earnestly, but what it was all about, Smee, who was rather stupid, did not know in the least. Anon he caught the word Peter. Most of all, Hook was saying passionately, I want their captain, Peter Pan. Twas he who cut off my arm. He brandished the hook threateningly. I've waited long to shake his hand with this. Oh, I'll tear him. And yet, said Smee, I've often heard you say that Hook was worth a score of hands for com hom combing the hair and other homely uses. Aye, the captain answered. If I was a mother, I would pray to have my children born with this instead of that. And he cast a look of pride upon his iron hand, 
and one of scorn upon the other hand. Then again he frowned. Peter flung my arm, he said, to a crocodile that happened to be passing by. I have often, says me, noticed your strange dread of crocodiles. Not of crocodiles, Hook corrected him, but of that one crocodile. He lowered his voice. It liked my arms so much, Smee, that it has followed me ever since, from sea to sea and from land to land, licking its lips for the rest of me. Oh, my goodness. In a way, said Smee, it's sort of a compliment. I want no such compliments, Hook barked. I want Peter Pan, who first gave the brute its taste for me. He sat down on a large mushroom, and now there was a quiver in his voice. Smee, he said huskily. That crocodile would have had me before this, but by a lucky chance it swallowed a clock, which goes tick-tock, tick-tock. So before it can reach me, I hear the tick and I bolt. He laughed, but in a hollow way. That's convenient for him. Some day, said Smee, the clock will run down, and then he'll get you. Hook wetted his dry lips. Aye, he said, that's the fear that haunts me. Still sitting down, since sitting down, he had felt curiously warm. Smee, he said, this seat is hot. He jumped up. Odds, bobs, hammer, and tongs, I'm burning. They examined the mushroom, which was of a size and solidity unknown to the, on the mainland. They tried to pull it up, and it came away at once in their hands, for it had no root. Stranger still, smoke began at once to ascend. The pirates looked at each other. <gasps> a chimney, they both exclaimed. They had indeed discovered the chimney of the home under the ground. It was the custom of the boys to stop it with a mushroom when enemies were in the neighborhood. Not only smoke came out of it, there also came children's voices, for so safe did the boys feel in their hiding place that they were gaily chattering. The pirates listened grimly and then replaced the mushroom. They looked around them and noted the holes in the seven trees. Did you hear them say Peter Pan's from home? Smee whispered, fidgeting with Johnny Corkscrew. Hook nodded. He stood for a long time, lost in thought and at last a curdling smile lit up his swarthy face. Smee had been waiting for it. Ungrip your plan, unrip your plan, Captain, he cried eagerly. To return to the ship, Hook replied slowly through his teeth, and cook a large, rich cake of jolly thickness with green sugar on it. There can be what, but one room below, for there's but one chimney. The silly moles had not the sense to see that they did not need a door apiece. This shows that they have no mother. We will leave the cake on the shore of the mermaid's lagoon. These boys are always swimming about there, playing with the mermaids. They will find the cake, and they will gobble it up, because they don't know how dangerous it is to eat a rich, damp cake. So Hook burst into laughter. Aha! We'll get them. Smee had listened with growing admiration. That's the wickedest, prettiest policy I ever heard of, he cried, and in their exultation they sang and danced. A vast belay, and when I appeared by fear they're overtook, knots left upon your bones when you have shaken claws with hook. They began the verse, but never finished it, for another sound broke in and stilled them. It was at first such a tiny sound that a leaf might have fallen on it and smothered it, but as it came nearer it was more distinct. Tick, tick, tick. Hook stood shuddering, one foot in the air. That crocodile! He gasped, and he bounded away, followed by his bosun. It was indeed the crocodile. It had passed the Native Americans, who were now on the trail of the other pirates. It oozed on after Hook. Once more, the boys emerged into the open, but the dangers of the night were not yet over. For presently, Nibs rushed breathless into their midst, pursued by a pack of wolves. The tongues of their pursuers were hanging out. The baying of them was horrible. Save me! Save me! cried Nibs, falling on the ground. But what can we do? What can we do? It was a high compliment to Peter that at that dire moment their thoughts turned to him. What would Peter do? The lost boys cried simultaneously. Almost in the same breath they added, Peter would look at them through his legs. And then, let's do what Peter would do. It is quite the most successful way of defying wolves. And as one boy, they bent and looked through their legs. The next moment is the long one. But victory came quickly. For, as the boys advanced upon them in the terrible attitude, the wolves dropped their tails and fled. Now, Nibs rose from the ground, and the others thought that his staring eyes still saw the wolves. But it was not wolves he saw. I've seen a wonderful -er thing, he cried. And they gathered around him eagerly. A great white bird is flying this way. What kind of a bird, do you think? I don't know, Nibs said, awestruck. But it looks so weary, and as it flies, it moans, Poor Wendy. Poor Wendy. I remember, said Slightly instantly, that there are birds called Wendy's. See, it comes, cried Curly, pointing to Wendy in the heavens. Wendy was almost now overhead, 
and they could hear her plaintive cry. But the more distinct came the shrill of Tinkerbell. The jealous fairy had now cast off all disguise of friendship and was darting at her victim from every direction, pinching savagely each time she touched. Oh. Hello, Tink, cried the wondering boys. Tink's reply rang out, Peter wants you to shoot the Wendy. It was not in their nature to question what Peter ordered. Let us do what Peter wishes, cried the simple boys. Quick, bows and arrows. All but Toodles popped down their trees. He had a bow and an arrow with him, and Tink noted it, and rubbed her little hands. Quick, Toodles, quick, she screamed. Peter will be so pleased. Toodles excitedly fitted the arrow to his bow. Out of the way, Tink, he shouted, and then he fired. <gasps> and Wendy fluttered to the ground with an arrow in her chest. <gasps> oh my goodness. That's the end of the chapter. That's awful. What do you think? Do you like Tinkerbell? I don't. I hope Wendy's okay. I'm very worried about her. Before we finish, thanks for reading that chapter with me. Before we finish up, I have to tell you our code word for our summer reading program. Have you signed up for your Read Squared account? If you have, then you can get a raffle ticket just for listening to our armchair adventures. So make sure you put in the code word. The code word for today is Wendy. Did you get it? Okay. Thanks for reading that with me. So join me tomorrow for chapter six of Armchair Adventures. Thanks for reading with me. Have a fun day.